All right, everybody, we are going to get started in our kidney session. Um, I would like to introduce you guys to our speaker, Dr. Falazade is a transplant nephrologist at Emory Transplant Center and an assistant professor of medicine at Emory University Medical School. He did his nephrology training at University of California, San Francisco, where he also received a master's in clinical research, followed by transplant nephrology fellowship at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Falazade's Research is focused on improving cardiovascular disease risk factors and outcomes in kidney transplant patients. Please welcome Dr. Palazzo. Well, you can put it on the device. Oh, okay, yes. sure. Yes. Okay, let me figure it out. I still have a suit for. Yes, I'm like, to... I'm like us. <laughs> Can you hear me or? Yeah. Yeah. Is it good? Yeah. Right. So thank you all for coming. I didn't expect such a large crowd in the morning. So uh, I'm excited to be here and thank you for inviting me. We can't hear you. Okay. okay. Let me. Put it on your tie. <laughs> How about now? Yeah. Better? Okay, let me. As high as I can. I just hold it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I might have some seen some of you at Emory. I have a hard last name. Patients call me Dr. K. I tell them don't call me Dr. F. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you come to Emory and see me now, you know what to call me. Uh, so. I'm talking about this topic because um, I feel that it's obesity is a big problem in our society, and um, we don't talk about it. We just tell patients as doctors, "Oh, go do diet and exercise and lose weight," but really, it doesn't happen. It's not like that. If it was easy, everybody would lose weight. So, um, I would like to talk about this. Uh, it's a big issue before transplant and after transplant, and talk about uh, the new medications that are getting introduced in this field. Um, and they're really changing the landscape of obesity. And we are starting to look at obesity as a, as a medical problem and not as like a personal failure or uh, issues with like not being able to control diet. It's really a, a, a genetic and uh, environmental problem because of the diet and uh, all the other issues. So we, we should look at it as a medical problem that has a medical treatment. So that's what I'm trying to focus on today. Okay, so I have no conflicts of interest about this topic. So um, a lot of you may have heard about BMI. Um, so BMI stands for body mass index. And the reason we use BMI is uh, we want to correct the weight for height because taller people usually are heavier. So we divide the uh, weight by, the, uh, by their height and get these numbers. So if, you are, uh, if your BMI is between 18.5 to 25, you have normal weight. If you're between 25 and 30, you're overweight. Between 30 and 35, obesity class one. 35 to 40, obesity class two, and more than 40, class three. Well, the problem with BMI is that it just uh, tells you how, how much you weigh, and depending on how tall you are, you get different BMI levels. It doesn't count for how much muscle you have, where your uh, uh, weight is accumulated. For example, the type of obesity that really has bad outcomes is the, the fat in, around the abdomen. And if like the fat is distributed around the body, it doesn't have as much of a bad outcome, but we really don't have a way now to differentiate these types of populations. So most transplant centers use BMI. Next slide. So this figure shows uh, prevalence of obesity in uh, United States population. And as you can see here, the different colors represent different 
uh, ethnicity. So the dark blue, the navy, represents white population. The lighter blue represents African Americans. The dark green one represents uh, Asians, and the light green represents uh, Hispanic population. So as you can see, except for Asians, obesity uh, prevalence in general population in U.S. is between uh, 40 to 60 percent. So it's a very common problem. And there's a close link between obesity and kidney disease. Uh, it, and obesity is a known risk factor for developing chronic kidney disease. And here in this uh, picture uh, on the left, you can see the, how uh, obesity plays a role in development of kidney disease. It, uh, so some of uh, obesity is related to lifestyle, but diet, physical activity, uh, smoking, alcohol consumption, and then Obesity is closely related to diabetes and hypertension, high blood pressure, and all of these are risk factors for developing kidney disease. Uh, obesity can make you have protein in your urine, which is called proteinuria, is a risk factor for developing kidney disease. It can make your lipid level go up. It can cause sleep apnea. A lot of patients require CPAP. It can uh, predispose you to cardiovascular disease, heart disease and it can cause kidney stone, and it increases the risk of some of common cancers, such as breast cancer. And all of these are risk factors for developing kidney disease and scarring in the kidney and eventually ending up on dialysis. Next slide. So this is a, from a study uh, <coughs> that they evaluated uh, the prevalence of obesity in kidney transplant recipients. So as you can see, that uh, light yellow cream color shows patients with normal BMI. About 30% of patients have normal BMI. Uh, about 34% uh, of patients, as you can see here, have uh, BMI in overweight range between 25 and 30. And about a third of patients, which is here, they have obesity. And a small number of patients, but three persons have the most severe degree of obesity, which is more than 40. So uh, it's a common problem in transplant population. Next slide, please. And as many of you may have gone through this process, then you want to get listed at different transplant centers, they may have different BMI criteria for listing. So some centers use BMI of 35, and some centers may use BMI of 40. And uh, they may not even like ask patients to come get evaluated for transplant if they see their BMI is more than their set level. And as I said, the main problem with this is uh, a lot of patients may have high BMI, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are not a good candidate for transplant. So some centers such as Emory, we evaluate each patient individually and don't restrict them based on just one number, that's BMI. So uh, we look at the patients as a whole and evaluate them whether they are a good candidate for transplant or not. This is a picture from our data at Emory that uh, comes from uh, my mentor, Dr. Larson. Uh, we are uh, looking at our patients at Emory who got transplanted. So here is the BMI at the baseline level. You can see we have some patients with obesity class one and higher levels of obesity. And this is three years after transplant. So as you can see, the number of people that are not obese here decreases. And then we have patients who develop higher levels of obesity three years after transplant. So you wonder why this happens. One of it is that, uh, as many of you have experienced it, after transplant, you feel better, your appetite gets better, mm -hmm. yeah. and you don't have all the dietary restrictions that you have before transplant, like you can eat high phosphorus food. Some of you develop low phosphorus and we tell you to eat more high phosphorus, and all of, almost all of the foods that have high phosphorus have high calories. <laughs> and then I sometimes tell patients like, eat nuts because your magnesium is low. And then I tell them, oh, your weight is going up. 
decrease the amount of calories you eat. And then I realized I'm telling them conflicting things. I tell them, I'm telling them to eat nuts and beans, right. and then they have high calories. So <laughs> it's, it, the other thing is that most some patients get prednisone, and prednisone stimulates appetite and can stimulate weight gain. So it's really a big issue. A lot of patients gain weight after transplant. And then here, uh, I, this slide comes from a study that they looked at patients with different levels of uh, obesity post-transplant, and they looked at the outcome. So as you can see here, the risk of mortality uh, dying for any cause increased as obesity increased. And then here, they looked at graft loss. You can see the risk of graft loss losing the transplant, the kidney increases with increasing obesity. And here they combined death and graft loss and the risk of that also went up. So it's, it's not good to gain weight after transfer. So I'm gonna talk about what we can do about it before and after transplant, but do you have any questions before we go to the next topic? So you showed that uh, that chart you just showed looks like that overweight it actually did better than normal weight as far as um, after transplant on the right upper right hand side. Um, yes. So that's a so here is underweight. Here is normal. I was looking at the other the graph. Right? Yes. Yes. So that's a really uh, good question. So this is like close to each other may not reach statistical significance, but then you're bringing up a really good uh, point is that uh, a lot of times uh, patients who have normal BMI may have had higher BMI before and then developed a problem, for example, cancer, or uh, they have issues that they're losing weight. So as you can see, underweight, is also associated with worse outcomes. So uh, that might be a contributing reason. But then you can see as they gain weight, then they, it goes up again. Make sense? Any other? I saw other hands. Okay. So um, now I'm going to talk about management of obesity, and I'm mainly going to focus on. Uh, some medications that you may have heard about them in the news. So uh, we have a relatively new group of medications. They were not in our textbooks when I went to medical <coughs> school 20 years ago. Uh, they are called GLP-1 receptor agonists. And uh, I'm going to show you a picture of how they work. But we have different names for them. One of them is called semaglutide. And the brand names uh, for the same medicine is Ozempic. You may probably have seen ads for it on TV. Ozempic is approved for treatment of diabetes. The other one is Beglobi. It's the same medicine, it's, uh, but it's approved for treatment of obesity. So they have different indications and therefore different brand names and different price. And the rebelsis is the same medicine, but taken orally, it's approved for treatment of diabetes. And then we have the other one, which is Pirzepatide or Monjaro. Uh, that's a dual acting GLP-1 and GIP agonist. So uh, this is approved for treatment of diabetes now, but it's under review by FDA for treatment of obesity, and we expect it's going to be approved soon for treatment of obesity too. So this is a slide that shows how these medications work. So when we eat and food enters our bowel, a small testing, it increases a hormone, uh, secretes a hormone called GLP-1. So this hormone is one of the reasons when we eat, we feel full and it decreases the food intake and delays gastric emptying and makes us make insulin. So when we eat, we secrete the insulin to uh, decrease the glucose level. So this is how our body works. So how these medicines work is that they stimulate the receptor for this molecule. So they basically make us eat less. 
So the way patients describe this, like a lot of patients tell me that before we started these medications, we were always thinking about food and food was the only thing we were thinking about. Now, now we can think about other things and now we realize how other uh, patients feel that like they don't think about food all the time. So it really makes the appetite go away and make the cal ma they make the calorie intake go low and that's how they make people lose weight. And uh, here I'm putting uh, the dosing for semaglutide, which is Begovi, and how it works. As I said, the, this is a once weekly injection. So you start low dose, like uh, 0.25 milligram is the starting dose, and you do it once weekly injection under skin for one month, and then you step up to 0.5, and you do it one, one injection a week for second month, and then some people may achieve the desired weight or uh, glucose control and stay there, or if not, they can go to the higher dose, one milligram or 1.7 milligram or 2.4 milligram. So uh, that's like you gradually go up. And the same is true about other uh, medicine, Mojaro. If you start low dose for a month and gradually step up. <laughs> this is a slide about uh, one of the first trials that showed semaglutide or Megovia or Zempe uh, was effective in causing weight loss. You can see here it's placebo and here is semaglutide and it caused about 16% weight loss at 68 weeks. So 16% weight loss is a really significant number uh, and uh, for patients who have dealt with obesity, it, it, it's not easy to achieve just with diet and exercise, although some do it, but it's, it's hard. <coughs> Here is uh, for Monjaro tirzipatide. They use different doses and compared it with placebo. As you can see, uh, five milligram caused about 16% uh, weight loss at 72 weeks. 10 milligram caused 21% weight loss and 15 milligram caused 22%. So significant weight loss. And here is a new medicine that's not on the market yet, but it has uh, it it affects three receptors, and it's uh, I expect it to come on the market in uh, next few years, and it's even more effective than those other medicines, and it can cause up to 24 percent weight loss at 48 weeks. As you can see, this graph didn't become flat, so. Patients may even lose more weight. And these are the weight loss levels that we get with uh, bariatric surgery. So these medications have the potential to, to replace bariatric surgery. And uh, can we go to the next slide? Their major side effects are GI side effects. They can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and this is because they, they affect the GI system, as I showed in that picture. They can make the emptying of the stomach slow and therefore nausea and GI side effects. And it usually happens when the medications are started and when the doses increase and uh, <coughs> usually improve over time. Oh, yeah. And then if, if patients are diabetic and they are taking these medicines with insulin or other medications such as glipizide or glyburide, these medicines like insulin, glipizide, they can decrease the blood sugar level and cause what we call hypoglycemia or low blood glucose blood sugar level. So if you take these medicines with insulin or glipizide, you need to monitor your sugar level. Sometimes you need to decrease the dose of insulin or other medicines to prevent low blood sugar level. Uh, there are other issues with these medicines. You may have heard a lot of People are taking them for weight loss and some of them don't need it. Like you have, may have seen like uh, jokes they make on TV about like Hollywood actors using it just for weight loss. So these medicines uh, go through shortage periods that they are not available in the market because they're used 
uh, by a lot of people and they are expensive and some of the insurance companies don't cover them unfortunately so uh, but i expect as more medications are going to come on the market from more companies there's going to be more competition and hopefully they become more available they also have some other interesting effects they have seen that people who use them have less affinity for alcohol they have even same people who were addicted to gambling stopped uh, <laughs> gambling so they may actually have some effects on the brain and uh, our uh, our behavior that we don't know yet about them so uh, if if people can tolerate their gi side effects they can potentially treat obesity so uh, uh, please yeah i have a lot to talk here <laughs> The, the, the thing about transplant population, so we don't have a lot of data before or after transplant. Uh, however, I have seen it myself and I've talked to my other colleagues. They are used in patients with advanced kidney disease, whether they are on, on dialysis or not. And uh, so far, as far as we know, they are safe. The patients with advanced kidney disease as, are more likely to develop side effects. So if somebody starts them on these medicines, they need to start low dose and gradually go up. And if they develop side effects, go back. Um, after transplant, a lot of patients get a medicine called mycophenolate or Celsept or myfortic. So if a lot of you that had transplant have gone through that. That, can, that medicine can cause GI side effects like nausea, diarrhea, upset stomach. So after transplant, it's better to Hold it until your creatinine reaches a state, steady state and your GI side effects, if you have any, go away. And then it can be restarted or can be started for the first time after transplant if patients develop high blood sugar or they are gaining weight. These are potential treatments. The other thing I've heard uh, some say against these medicines is that, oh, so if you stop it, you gain weight. Well, that's true. But nobody says if you stop your uh, high blood pressure medicines, your blood pressure go up, goes up. <laughs> or nobody says, oh, you're a transplant recipient, so if you so stop your immunosuppression medications, you're going to lose the kidney. So obesity is a long, uh, is a lifetime problem. So the medications for it also need to be taken long term. Uh, so it's expected that if somebody starts these medicines and uh, loses weight, they probably need to be on it long term, probably for the rest of like their life. But interestingly, I just saw a uh, report from the company that makes Ozempic that they were doing a trial to improve kidney outcomes. And they saw that the patients who got Ozempic had better kidney outcomes compared with patients who didn't get Ozempic. And they stopped the trial early. So we are going to learn more about these medicines, but they may actually have protective effects on the kidney. So it's very exciting. Any questions? What is the name of the medication you said that's coming? Oh, uh, can you? Yeah, sorry. It's called ret uh, Reta True Time. Okay. You see, it's not. It's not on the market yet, but it, it causes significant weight loss. So, uh, and, the, and these medications are injection and they're working on oral versions too. So I think we are gonna hear more, more about this. Yes. How does the prednisone play into this? If you're on prednisone and you're taking this, are they counterintuitive to each other? So you're asking you ask a great question. So prednisone can increase blood sugar level. So it's one of the reasons uh, people uh, develop high blood sugar level after transplant, the glucose may go up. Uh, the other reason after transplant that patients, uh, a lot of patients have diabetes, uh, and when they go on dialysis, because the kidneys destroy insulin, when you go on dialysis or when your kidneys are not working, there is more insulin around. So patients on dialysis or at patients with advanced kidney disease may think their diabetes got better, or some of them even think their diabetes got cured because you may not need insulin at all. And then you get a functioning kidney with kidney transplant, 
and it starts destroying insulin. So then you need more insulin again after transplant. So prednisone is another factor that makes the sugar level go up, may stimulate appetite. So these medicines counter the effect of prednisone. But, uh, mo but like at Emory, we usually put you on a low dose prednisone five milligram, and it doesn't have as much of effect on appetite and weight and sugar level as the higher doses may have. Make sense? I mean, I just know I, I developed diabetes after being on prednisone for eight years. I had my transplant. Yes. Now yes. So I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, actually. Uh, I got to deal with it as a side of it. Exactly. And some patients have uh, predisposition to diabetes before transplant, but it doesn't show it itself because, as I said, there is more insulin around because the kidneys are not working. And then after transplant, it shows itself. And medications other than prednisone, a lot of you probably have received Tacrolimus or Prograf or Invarsus are the brand names. That also is toxic to the pancreas and the beta cells that make insulin. So that's another reason patients develop uh, diabetes after transplant. And the other thing is weight gain that can cause insulin resistance. So there are many factors that contribute to uh, diabetes after transplant. What about infusion? Oh, good question. So uh, at Emory, we had a center that used Bella, Belatacept. It's a monthly sure. infusion. So there are studies that show patients who are on Belatacept compared with Tacrolimus. So at Emory, you get Tacrolimus for the first year, and then you go off of it. Uh, have better blood sugar levels and lower risk of diabetes compared with Tacrolimus. If you're taking, like, say, something, and you, you get to your ideal weight, and you say you have to take it for life, how do you, how do you, you know, continue to lose weight? How do you stop that? Great, good question. So. When I say you probably need to continue it for life, these medicines are new, so it's like pay attention to the probably. But they have done studies that they have stopped Ozempic in a group of patients, but they like continue to emphasize on diet and exercise. And a group of patients that they did the same, but continued Ozempic. And on those who stopped Ozempic, the uh, weight went up after they stopped it. So if if you, for example, are on a certain dose of Ozempic and you lose a lot of weight, you, if you are fine with that dose, you probably stay on that dose. Or if you lose significant weight, you may go on a lower dose. And it's possible some may, may be able to stop it, but their appetite comes back. So it's, it, we are learning more and more about these medicines. But as I said, I think the, the saying that, oh, if, if you lose weight and then you stop these medicines, you gain weight back. It's like saying, oh, you have high blood pressure, you have hypertension, you stop it, your blood pressure goes up again. So it's the same concept, if it makes sense. Go ahead. Uh, when something like Bugoni is given, is it appropriate for someone who's overweight but has low blood sugar? So uh, if somebody has... Uh, <coughs> Obesity, but no, like you mean normal blood sugar? Like, my glucose level last lapse was 56. Oh, so uh, I think you need to get checked why you have low blood sugar level. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because uh, they, they can potentially, uh, uh, may, I mean, usually low blood sugar level happens when you take insulin or some other medicines with that. But yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's better to get evaluated why you have low blood sugar. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll answer all of you. <laughs> Go ahead. Are you finding the will go be more prevalent in the market now? Because I I took it, but I haven't been able to get it since I started. Yeah, it, they, they, there are issues with uh, availability, and they like provide it, and then they become unavailable. So it's like they're you know, working on it, but because of high demand, they are having those issues. So yeah. How do you determine who gets the tacrolimus, however you pronounce it, tacrolimus, as opposed to infusion? How's that determined out? Good question. So it's like potato and potato, tacrolimus and tacrolimus. <laughs> so uh, at Emory, most patients get Bella 
because of its uh, better uh, side effects profile over long term. The reason for it is that there's this concept that if you're getting acrolimus, uh, although it prevents rejection over short term, over long term it can cause scarring in the kidney. Uh, and that's why, on average, a deceased donor kidney lasts 10 years and a, a living donor kidney lasts 15 years. I mean, I say average, it means some last longer, some last shorter. So, Bella uh, really doesn't have many side effects except that it suppresses the immune system very effectively. <laughs> so, it puts to a higher risk of viral infection. So, one of the viral infections that develops after transplant is EVV, is Epstein-Barr virus. So EVV can cause a type of uh, blood cancer called PTLD, or post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. It's a blood cancer. It's a lymphoma, basically. Uh, so if, if you have a donor who is positive for EVV, meaning they had EVV, and there's probably EVV in their kidney, and a recipient that uh, is negative for EVV, then there will be a higher risk of uh, developing this PTLD after transplant, this lymphoma. So anybody who, any recipient who is negative for EVV before transplant, <coughs> because of this higher risk of developing uh, this complication after transplant, we don't give them better. The other virus uh, is called CMV, or cytomegalovirus, if you have a donor that's positive for CMV and the recipient is negative for CMV, the same issue. If you get Bella, you are at higher risk of developing uh, CMV disease, so we don't give you Bella. Other than that, most patients get Bella in um, My question is, I, I actually have a question. Um, so four-year post uh, transplantation, I had a liver and a kidney. Um, I've never heard of this Bella that you're speaking on right now. Um, and I, my thoughts would be why would both transplant centers, both Emily and Piedmont, not be on the same page as far as that medication? Because this is my very first time ever hearing of Bella. I've been taking CELSA and Fibrac for me for four years since I've had it. So, so Bella has, uh, has been mostly used in, uh, in the transplant population. It hasn't been widely used in other organ transplants. So the other thing is, uh, most other centers other than Emory don't use Bella. At Emory, we have a we have an infrastructure for everybody to get it. Uh, we have like teams dedicated for Bella. Uh, other centers sometimes it, it's really difficult to coordinate and give it to the patients. So it's like center preference. Emory uh, surgeons were instrumental in uh, <coughs> studying and developing Bella, so we feel strongly that this is a really good medicine for our patients, but it's uh, at other centers not widely used. Is that a pill form? Is that an injection? It's a monthly infusion. So you have to go to an infusion center and get it monthly, and uh, the the issue with that is that sometimes it could be costly to get monthly infusion and it has the trouble of, yeah, usually we find a way to get it, give it to our patients, uh, but it could have a higher copay, so that's an uh, undesired side effect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every, there's no free lunch. <laughs> yes, I, I currently take um, solicity, uh -huh. so I have not noticed that my appetite is suppressed at all. <laughs> why, why is that? Good. So solicity is an earlier version of this group of medications, GLP-1 receptor agonists. So solicity, uh, I haven't seen any head-to-head uh, -head comparison, but these medications like Monjar or Ozempic, they have more of a weight loss effect than solicity. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes. I'm one of those people that didn't have CMV until I got to get transplant. So that means I can't get the Bella. So, so are you a transplant patient or are you waiting to get transplant? No, I got my transplant. If your donor has CMV, 
Yes, that's the Okay, so your donor had, you didn't have it. Right. Okay, so you didn't get that. Right, I don't get that, but I take programs. Uh -huh. I'm that that's hard to get. So I'm just questioning is there something other than programs that I can that I should be taking instead. So, so, uh, um, if if you don't have, I mean, even patients who develop diabetes, it's not it's not by itself a reason to come on program. So most other centers use program, and I would say Vanderbilt they use program for type problems, and it's a safe medicine. And usually after first few months after transplant, you go on a lower dose. So it's like I don't want to scare you that program is bad. The program saves the kidney, but I was explaining why we use Bella, and sometimes. You may get tested. I mean, talk to your transplant nephrologist. If you have, you may have people of TMB later, and they may be able to switch to develop. Oh, yeah. If if you have CMB, like if you have had CMB and potentially made an antibody, you could potentially be switched to develop. But this is something you need to talk to your uh, transplant nephrologist about. Yes. Uh, going back to the premise of it, um, is that something? Because I know you mentioned. Uh, you have a you know, very low dose. Is that something that can be eventually weaned off completely? Good question. So this is a question that comes up all the time, and I know most patients don't like to be on prednisone. So there, there's some evidence that if you come off prednisone, you may increase the chance of <laughs> rejection. And at Emory and most other centers, we keep patients on prednisone, but there are some centers that try prednisone free regimen. Yes. Um, I'm a transplant patient, and I have gained in weight, but weight my kidney is failing again, and I'm on a waiting list. Uh, are you taking like cyclosporine or plaquenolamide? Cyclosporine, so that. Yeah. So uh, as I said, uh, cyclosporine and plaquenolamide. There is this concept that over long term they may cause scarring in the kidney. So that could be one of the reasons that the like you do everything you're supposed to do, take your medicines all the time. But uh, over long term, the kidney can develop scarring and uh, gradually the kidney function declines. And then at some point, you may, you may need your transplant again. How many years did you have your transplant? Over Twenty-seven. Well, that's really good time. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> yeah, and and sometimes there is also like there be a low level chronic rejection that happens in the kidneys, so that could be a contributing factor in some patients. It was but, a disease. To, uh, yeah. Yeah. So the the living donor's kidneys on average last longer because we screen the donor and we make sure they are healthy. The kidney is healthy. With the deceased donors, the kidney may get some injury when that donor is passing away. So patients who are waiting for transplant, I always tell them if you can find a living donor, that's really. A better option for you than the deceased donor, but you did a great job. 27 mm -hmm. years again for fair, and it will last forever. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the goal. We hope at some point we will have kidneys for life. With an online question, um, yes, she asked, uh, she started on Bella after her transplant. I switched to Tacrolimus due to cost. Is it wise to switch back to Bella after six years of taking Tacrolimus? She's asking if she can switch. Yeah, like is it wise to switch after six years of taking one medicine? So if the kidney function is stable and the patient doesn't have any issues, then uh, it's, I mean, it's okay to stay on Tacrolimus. As I said, it's standard of care at most, most other centers. And Bella has the issue with infusion and cost. So each one of them have, have, uh, have their own pros and cons. Yes. When you switch back and forth, doesn't that put you at risk? Uh, if you want to switch from program to Bella and go back to program, isn't that a risk factor? That's a really good question. So the issue with Bella is that um, if you're on Bella and not type problems, you're you can be at a higher risk of a type of rejection called cellular rejection. So uh, at Emory for the first 
nine months after transplant, we put patients on uh, four medicines, prednisone, mycophenolate, the brand name is self -Sep, and then there's a version of it called MyFortic that has lower, side of, uh, lower GI side effects in some patients, and then prednisone, and then monthly infusion Bella. So four medicines for the first nine months. Then around month uh, nine, we start tapering the tacrolimus, decreasing the dose of tacrolimus. And then by 12 months, we usually take you off of it. In that three months, there is a little bit higher risk of rejection in a small number of patients. And that's because people have different immune systems and some have stronger immune system that may cause rejection. So in that, other than that subset of population, most patients do find <laughs> just Bella, mycophenolate, and prednisone. But changing when you have a stable kidney function, and then you change even the suppression, there is, an, there is always a risk that in between these changes, something may happen. So that's why I say if somebody is stable and they don't have any major issues, uh, probably they're fine to stay on their medicine. But everybody needs to talk to their nephrologist because it's, everybody has different uh, profile. Yes? Yes. Uh, are there tests uh, that can be done to find out you see if scarring in the kidney is taking place. To prevent scarring in the kidney? Yeah. Is there something we can do? Are there a test that we can see if it's taking place? So, uh, good question. So, uh, scarring in the kidney is really best seen on biopsy. Some centers uh, do biopsy for everyone. For example, on one month, six, six months after transplant. But biopsy has its own side effects. For example, patients can develop bleeding. So at Emory, we don't do biopsy for everyone. We only do it if the creatinine goes up. Uh, so other than biopsy, there is uh, the only way we can uh, think about scarring is that the creatinine is gradually, slowly going up. And the way to prevent uh, scarring is try to keep the blood pressure under control. If, you, if somebody has diabetes, by controlling their blood sugar level, that decreases the risk of developing scarring and having a healthy lifestyle. So these are some ways to keep scarring under control. And then some of it is unfortunately out of our control uh, and it, it may happen over long term. So that's our goal in transplant to improve the long term outcomes because we have done it relatively good job of preventing the rejection in the first year after transplant, having good outcomes short term, but we need to work on more better long term outcomes. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. So, yes. um, I know this is probably way in the future, but I have seen some, you know, studies about um, kidneys from pigs or, so, you know, things like that. Can you speak more about yeah, that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So, Xeno transplant, meaning mostly kidneys from uh, pigs, uh, is an upcoming era in transplantation. And it can be a, a life changer because then we don't have to wait four, five, seven years for kidney. But it has its own issues. So I was uh, talking to uh, one of the surgeons uh, who is a pioneer in this field, and we were talking about the differences between human kidney and pig kidney and how it's uh, kidneys coming from pigs uh, be uh, becomes mainstream, then transplant nephrologists need to train in uh, <laughs> pig nephrology because, <laughs> 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 because they are, the pig, pig kidney is not exactly like human kidney and there are differences between human and pig kidney and there are potential infections that patients may get. So we are not there yet, but we may be there soon. So, for the other option, isn't it to take like a, a graft from your own body? So, the other concept is making or developing a kidney, and that's something else they're working on. It, uh, we are not there yet, yeah. but at some point in the future, we may be able to like make kidneys from stem cells. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that uh, they're working on it are, uh, is the uh, what we call bioartificial kidney, like small dialysis machine that they can put you on instead of 
like going into dialysis center. So these are all potential treatments for kidney failure. How many years out do you think? It's hard to say, probably uh, 10 or 15, but it, things change fast. So, <laughs> But I should say, like, we have a lot of, so heart, I mean, heart, the main function of heart is pumping blood. Kidney does a lot of works that, like, uh, heart may not. And we have, like, devices that pump blood, but still there are patients that need heart transplant. So I think these options, like xenotransplantation and pig kidney or, like, bioartificial kidney, they may uh, help with decreasing the burden of dialysis, but I think kidney transplant from humans is going to stay there because it's Currently, the best option for treatment of kidney disease. Yes. I wanted to ask. I'm not a college transplant. I'm in the process of getting on the list for transplant, and I had recently had to have a blood transplant. So I wanted to know. Um, I didn't understand how they were explaining about the antibodies, and if I have two relatives that I'm trying to get tested, does that? Because I've had a transplant, does that, I mean, not a transplant, but a blood transfusion, does that eliminate, now, does that eliminate the transplant that eliminates the... That's a really good question. So, uh, we can form antibodies against different antigens. Uh, so, it's a common issue in women because uh, when they get pregnant, your children, half of their antigens come from their father. So, and uh, the mother can form antibodies against the antigens that their children have that come from the father. So that's one way patients can develop antibodies against potential donors. The other way is blood transfusion, as you mentioned. Anytime you get blood transfusion, you can form antibodies against the the person who donated blood to you. And uh, the other way is getting a previous transplant, like someone who had a kidney transplant and for whatever reason now they need a second transplant, they may form antibodies against their first donor. So whenever you form antibodies, depending on how common the antigen you form the antibody against is, it may decrease the chance of you have finding a donor. So they calculate the number called PRA. It stands for panel reactive antibody. And we want it to be zero or a low number. So in transplant, some of the things we do is like, doesn't make sense. So PR, high PRA is bad. So we want it to be low. PRA means, for example, if somebody has PRA of 90%, it means that on average, 90% of people in the general population, this recipient has antibody against it. So we, we want your PRA to be low, and as much as possible, we try to avoid blood, blood transfusion in patients who are waiting for kidney transplant, because it can potentially make them make antibody against some donors that they didn't have antibody against them before. Make sense? <laughs> sure. My personal story, I had 98% rejection rate. So that meant only 2% of the world population could match me. Oh, okay. So I was on the transplant list for 12 years. I was living on the value as number, and I did list that you ate. I got my kidney 11 years ago. I got a pediatric kidney patient, so it was a toddler. And I had to be a both kid. So it's still a possibility, even with that high antigen rate, but it does make you kind of wait longer than others will probably. Thank you. Thank you for explaining. <laughs> 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 My question is like moving forward, kind of like, um, will there be any development on preventive medicines to save people from? Having to go on transplant and dialysis and things of that nature? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, she's asking about treatments to prevent people needing dialysis to begin with. So, yes, uh, so you may have uh, heard about 
this group of medications called SGLT2 inhibitors, they, you may have seen ads, for example, for Jardians. <laughs> <laughs> for, yeah, like uh, uh, the other one is uh, Farsiga. These are medicines that were initially developed for treatment of diabetes, and they make uh, patients pee out sugar. But then interestingly, they saw that they decreased the risk of developing uh, kidney disease and heart disease. And now they are approved for treatment of non-diabetic patients with chronic kidney disease. So a lot of patients are potentially candidates to receive these medicines when uh, they have kidney disease, they are 14 in the urine uh, before transplant, and it can slow their progression of kidney disease. The other thing is a lot of patients unfortunately have for example, high blood pressure or have diabetes and don't know about it. Maybe about half of the patients I see before transplant for evaluation, when I ask them, when you found out you have kidney disease, they say, oh, when I needed to start the house. And many of them are young patients. So these people, if we knew they have high blood pressure, if we knew they have diabetes and we would have controlled high blood pressure, diabetes, we would have prevented them from developing advanced kidney disease and needing to help. So that's really, that really needs to be our focus as a, as a country and as a population to prevent people needing from uh, trans, needing transplant dialysis to begin with. So, and, and these medicines that I talked about, they can potentially, we, can, we will find out more about them, but they can potentially be beneficial for the kidney too. So uh, we have a long way to go to Prevent developing kidney disease. But, like, even like, you know, somebody like me that's post about eight years, I never had any kind of diabetes issues or nothing like that. Only thing I'm on is um, the cell cell, the brain bone, and belly. Mm -hmm. So, like, um, like with the prednisone, I've been noticing my appetite has increased. Yeah. I have gained some weight, but not like a ridiculous amount of weight. So, like being on the um, prednisone, so what are the things that we can do being on prednisone, you know, to control the excessive eating? Because it ain't like I want to eat, it's it be something crazy to me. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's what I was talking about. So, uh, if you if you are doing a high blood sugar level, or if your weight has significantly go up and your BMI is above 30, you can talk to your primary care doctor to see if you're if you qualified to get one of these medications. Uh, the other thing is uh, there are things we can do with the diet to uh, help with weight. Is for example, try to eat more vegetables and more fruits, and try to avoid processed food and what we call high calorie, meaning like small size, but uh, with full of calorie, like fast food if you can avoid it. If you eat like vegetables, they have high volume but low calories, so they fill you up. They make the uh, the sense of uh, the hungry feeling go away easier. So there, are, you make help if you can talk with a nutritionist and they can give you some guides. There are very good resources on uh, like uh, kidney websites about kidney disease patients, what diet they should follow, uh, but. Uh, the other thing is some people count the amount of calories they eat. So, and, and there are studies that show if you count, you're more cognizant of how much you eat. And the other thing is try to burn more calories. I tell my patients, try to walk or run or bike like 15, 20 minutes at least, four or five times a week. And also do weights. Okay. If you build muscles, they eat sugar and they help with control controlling blood sugar levels. So do small waves and, and increase them as you cover. I'm sorry, we need to yeah. wrap up. We're over time. Oh, okay. Sorry. So I had some slides about bariatric surgery. It can be used before or after transplant. What is that? It's like a gastric sleeve or other methods to oh, okay. like patients uh, with surgery losing weight. Oh. But uh, yeah, if we are over time, then thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, I'll be here. You can come ask me.